Hello, guys. Today we see fewer students. I guess uh, the excitement of polynomials uh, has not been shared enough. Uh, you know, after after of course of course that gets me you know into my Ivan the Terrible mood. So we'll see. So. <clears throat> Let's remember, guys, what, what, what we uh, spoke about last time. We were dealing with the differentiation of exponential functions. Do you remember how we carried it out? The limit was not a simple quantity as before. Yes? But we start with this uh, second notation of differentiation. We are finding the slope at some point x and then suddenly realize that um, we are only required to find the slope of the tangent line at x equal to zero, which is this formula. Even though we cannot solve this limit, we may believe that this limit exists. In other words, we're saying f prime of zero. Yes, and, uh, and what makes us uh, have this belief? Well, we, you do that all the time. Do you remember I mentioned uh, you um, were in school, you were solving equations like x squared equal to 25. And when you solve this equation, you can say x equal to plus or minus five. That's beautiful and wonderful because well, you have a sense of what is five. But what do you do when you uh, solve the equation x squared equal to five? The answer with which you got away is plus minus root five. But what is root five? It's nothing more than saying the number that when multiplied by itself or the number that when squared gives you five. In other words, uh, that's the same thing that we just used uh, in symbols f prime of zero. You just uh, were not used to it. In some sense, it feels like we are cheating. Yes. So then we calculate limit as h goes to zero of a to the h minus one over h. And we realize that uh, this limit, uh, well, we can estimate it perhaps with the use of a calculator. We plug in one over a thousand because we are hoping that uh, uh, one over a thousand is a small number. So this is saying that uh, there will be a limit when h is striving to be zero. Now, 0 0.001 might look to us subjectively like a small enough number to have a sense of what that quantity would look like. Plugging it in the calculator, we get 0 0.693. Uh, doing the same thing with, let's say, uh, 3 to the h minus 1 over h, we get 1.099. And we have a sense that uh, we can get numbers close to 1. And the reason we like numbers uh, the numbers close to one essentially because you see the derivative will not change the function if f prime of zero will actually equal to will actually equal to one okay so uh here is a sense okay i mean you see uh so we we, we are led to investigate a function of the form you see because this idea about e it's a very uh, it's a fictional thing right now we do not know uh, what is even exponential functions? If you think about it carefully, even a creature like exponential function is rather mystical to us because maybe you know what it means two to the power of three, but what is two to the power of pi, right? So such, such ideas, uh, you, if you press two to the power of pi in your calculator, your calculator spits something out. What is happening truly, okay? Uh, so we are hoping that's the hypothesis that there will be a number between two and three uh, that, uh, it will be e to the x, this thing exponential. And when you take the derivative, you get e to the x uh, back. And in particular, we are trying to then find a function whose derivative is equal to itself. And uh, because we know exponential functions that zero are equal to one, we are hoping that, um, that we will know uh, the reason we say uh, the function at zero one is because we, you know, it, it faintly relates to exponentials. Uh, any exponential to the power of zero is one, yes? Now, why would such, um, uh, why would such uh, information be interesting to us? Why do we right away 
start suspecting that something is important, uh, which, which is happening here. Derivative of a function equal to the function. Maybe I will, I'll tell you one small story, if you will allow me, right? So, um, you know, imagine that you are a ghost hunter, right? You know, like um, in the old movies, right? You've seen it maybe, right? You, you know the movie Ghost Hunters, yes? And you come and uh, you investigate a poltergeist. Yes, and, and then uh, what you see is, um, you know, the room is upside down, everything turned, everything broken, the refrigerator broken, uh, the plates are on the floor, uh, the piano is on the table, right? What do you pay attention to? What do you, what do you notice if you are a smart ghost hunter? You know what you notice? You don't look at, uh, at where the case was made. You ask, what did the ghost leave unmoved? Okay? What was not changed is the important question. What was not touched? Because that's the key to understand this ghost. And let me uh, give you a, an illustration of uh, what I mean. This is just, a, you know, what you call a Bauchgefühl, a, a sense in your stomach that you have, that you develop once you have enough of experience. So suppose, suppose guys, that this was actually true. So, uh, so uh, they asked a statistician during World War II to uh, evaluate uh, airplanes that came from combat, from uh, bombing raids over Germany, let's say. They asked uh, the statistician to evaluate where uh, should the more armor be added? Okay, so the, the airplanes, they came, they were damaged. And the question was, where uh, should the armor be added? And to make the question much simpler, guys, to make the question much simpler, I'll divide the airplane into three sections. And I'll show you where you had the damage and where you didn't have the damage, yes? So suppose that the airplane is divided in, uh, into those three sectors. So uh, we have uh, sector one, we have sector two, and we have sector three, the tail section. And let's suppose that we notice that there is uh, damage in here and uh, there is uh, damage in there. Good? That's where we notice there is damage where uh, would you recommend uh, that uh, more armor will be added? Sector one, sector two, or sector three? You can only add it in one, in one place, right? Maybe even, uh, let me actually uh, make it so, so it's less ambiguous. I will say, let's say over here, uh, that means that there's, there was more damage to the front. Okay. Okay. Joshua says sector one. Ibad says uh, in front. Okay. That's very interesting. I'd like to see what all of you are saying. Uh, Dragon says sector one. Yeah. Come on, guys. Uh, simple question. Barely math, right? I'd like to really know what you think, all of you. Wake up, drink some coffee, and let me know. One. One, okay, great. One, one, mm hmm So uh, Lakey says, okay, two, interesting. Okay, H Helen says one, come on, uh, everybody else, what do you say? You can do it, I'm sure. Kirill says three. You can, you can say anything you want. You can change your answer. I mean, I just want to see your guess. Kirill says sector three. I think three, Irvin, uh, okay, interesting. Okay, Steven, interesting. Some of you might have heard of it. It's, it's pretty famous, but uh, so most of you guys, and that's the important thing, right? Here is, uh, most of you said uh, sector one, there is more damage. No. It is sector two where you want to add the armor. Why? Because that means if the damage is in sector two, the airplane does not come back, 
Yes, that's the poltergeist that I mentioned. You see, what you, you look at, oh my God, that's where, where more things were thrown. No, the key to solving this is to see where nothing happened. You see? So that's an, an instance. If you, are, if you are trained to think mathematically, you right away think sector two because the poltergeist here, the poltergeist are, that's a damage to the airplane hasn't been done to sector two. So in mathematics, once you have more experience, you right away think, my God, oh my God, nothing happened here. And that is extremely important. Okay? So in here with derivatives, where is the poltergeist? With the derivatives, uh, well, x squared. Is x squared uh, changed under differentiation? It is, yes? x squared is changed under differentiation, guys. Look at it. Uh, derivative of x squared is 2x. So because there was change, right? The derivative uh, moved or destroyed or did something to x squared, x squared is not as interesting, okay? You always want to ask what was invariant, what was not bothered, what was not touched. Good. So the, so we are led to the investigation. Derivative of a function is the same function. Derivative does not touch this function. At zero, the function is equal to one. Okay. Now, you see, we, we are solving it in general, but if you cannot think this way, you can always keep in mind that we mean here uh, e to the x. I want to know what is e to the x. Right? But if you, are, if you are kind of already a better trained, you already think, well, I don't know what e to the x is. Let me just find what uh, things have derivative equal to itself. So investigating it. So first we ask ourselves, is e to the x a polynomial? Remember that question? And why do we ask that is because in first grade, you could possibly understand polynomials. You know multiplication, you know addition. So that's the simplest operation. And machines, if you kind of consider them, I'm sure many of you should know them far better than me. I'm like from the 19th century. That's when I was born. So um, uh, you, you know what polynomials are because machines can only do addition and through addition, you can simulate multiplication. So is e to the x, or could a function whose derivative is equal to itself be a polynomial? And the answer is, is what? Could it be a polynomial? Right in the comments. I mean, I, I'm hoping guys that you are just, you know, you're not just chewing uh, grass, right? Uh, when I don't see you, right? You are thinking about something you want to not be, well, the Hebrew word for it is bema, which means uh, cattle. Right? It's much better than what it sounds in English. Right? I, you can kind of imagine, there's nothing that pisses me more than a cow. Right? It's just, uh, I want you to freaking think. Be a predator. Okay, so why can't, uh, a very simple question, why can't, um, e to the x or a function whose derivative is unchanged be a polynomial? What's the immediate discrepancy that we can notice? What can we notice, my friends? Well, how do you know? You see, Ibad, you're just saying uh, polynomial using multiplication and addition if you have a square root, but what do I know about square roots? Mostly I guess. So if I have square root of 25, I just guess because I know five times five is equal to 25. You understand what square roots are, guys? So uh, somebody mentioned square root. So, so we can begin thinking this way, right? So for example, E cubed seems like it's, if the number exists, it's E times E times E, okay? 
but e to the one half is root of e, and we don't know how to represent roots. That's uh, that's what Ibad is saying, and that's kind of um, beginning to be on the right track. But but we do not know what roots are. We haven't figured a, a formula for them. Otherwise, if you, we did, we, we we could take the we could take square root uh, square root of uh, five. Good. So we don't necessarily understand this, and especially not this. And also, even with multiplication, you see a polynomial is using the same set of operations. Yes? It uses the same set of operations. Uh, in other words, uh, for example, p of x equal to 3 minus 7x plus x squared. It uses, that means here is the input, you see? It's three minus seven times input plus the input squared. But uh, here, it seems like I'm using the input cubed. You see, e cubed, it's e times e times e, but what about, let's say, if I have e to the power of five, that's e times e times e times e times e. Yes? So I'm not using uh, the same number of multiplications. Maybe that's an accident. And still, that's not a very good uh, argument why uh, e, um, to the power of x is not a polynomial. Okay, what is uh, what is the most the derivative is now now good, right? So we know something about polynomials. We know how to take derivatives of polynomials, right? We already know the shortcut even. Yes, guys. So here is uh, the square polynomial. The square polynomial, I take derivatives enough of them and it's zero. I mean, I reduce it to absurdity, right? Clearly uh, a function that's not equal to look at it. Um, guys, do you understand what I mean by abstract, right? You, 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 when, when we are saying uh, derivative of a function equals to itself, you think e to the x, but we are asking this question in general. Can I find all functions whose derivative uh, is equal to themselves? And at zero, it's equal to one. That already eliminates the second line, eliminates zero. Z derivative of zero is zero. So if you take derivative of zero, it's not changed, but that's a trivial function in a sense, right? Derivative of zero is always zero. So if the function identically equals to zero, it's not changed by derivatives. But this here will prevent uh, the function from being uh, the zero function. Yes? Guys, I, I'm talking to you and you understand me, correct? Uh, or I'm not just talking to empty void. Write in the comments, do you follow what was said so far, please? I lose sleep over this uh, thing, guys. So please do study, right? Uh, it is, it just, I know this material. I want you to know it. Good. If you don't understand something, you stay in office. You talk about it. You are going to be high quality student. Correct? So it cannot be, it cannot be a quadratic because uh, look at it. Here is a typical quadratic. That's the best easy way to tell the difference, right? If uh, uh, one, prop, one, one object uh, does not share a quality with, uh, with something else, they cannot be the same object. You understand? You, you found the difference between them. That's a very simple type of uh, thinking here. So could e to the x be a polynomial of degree two? The answer is no, because take derivatives enough, take up to the third derivative and you get zero. And e to the x is, is, if it exists, clearly not equal to zero or any function uh, that at zero equals to one and whose derivative does not disappear, does not make it disappear, cannot be, uh, cannot be uh, the zero function. Good. Similarly, it cannot be a cubic polynomial because cubic polynomial vanishes after taking three of the, sorry, taking four derivatives yet uh, a function whose derivative is itself will not disappear no matter how many derivatives we take because each new derivative does not change the function. Are you clear? Very simple, right? It's, it's, it's so, it's, to me, it seems like it's like, it's, it's just, uh, it's as bright as daylight. There is just no reason uh, to be confused here, right? They just say, if you understand what we're seeking, why we're seeking it, if, if polynomials make sense to you, if thinking exists in your mind, that's absolutely very simple. It should be. So could it be possibly a polynomial of degree n? 
of uh, degree n, meaning a degree one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, a million, right? The more degrees I add, the more degrees of freedom I have. You see, because I have more coefficients to control, to control, I can always make some of the coefficients zero. So if it's degree up to one hundred. That means it could be a quadratic if I make uh, the after the second degree every every constant every coefficient zero, or I can basically control quite a lot of things. I have more flexibility with the uh, polynomials up to degree one hundred. So could it possibly be a polynomial of any finite degree? No, it cannot possibly be. Yes. It cannot possibly be because a polynomial of degree n for any n, if it's degree three, take four derivatives and it's, it's vanished to zero. If it's of degree a million, take a million and one derivatives and it's vanished uh, to zero. So if it's a finite degree, eventually the derivative will destroy, deplete it and uh, make it disappear. And that's for absurdity. You might kind of say, if take one derivative, a polynomial of degree 100 is, is now after one derivative of degree 99. And uh, that means it's changed, you might say, right? But if you take many, many derivatives, that's even better because you reduce it to zero, it's obviously not the same thing. You understand? You always, uh, you become very paranoid when you do mathematics because uh, you see that you're surprised too frequently. So I know, at least know that this function is not supposed to be constant. Good. So, but I still, you see, if, if you are clever, and that is kind of now a flight of the imagination. If I am clever, I make the leap of faith. In other words, I demand that this thing be a polynomial. And then I realize what did not work. What didn't work is that it was a finite polynomial, okay? And if you made this, uh, this step, uh, that's now a leap of faith. That means now you can get to the Holy Grail, like in Indiana Jones. You jumped and you say, okay, wonderful. This is going to go on forever. Okay, there's whatever that even means. We can uh, be critical later. Uh, it goes on forever. And then what are the coefficients? If I can find the coefficients, I can calculate. And then uh, how do I find uh, the coefficient a zero? Uh, I know something about this function. I know uh, how to take derivatives of this function. Yes, and, and how to do it on the right. And I know uh, the value of this function at one very important number at zero. So how do I calculate coefficient a zero, please? Type in the comments if you remember. And it should not be by memory. It's just look at it. It's obvious if you realize what it is. Yes, but, but first a zero. How do I find a zero before I uh, do anything else? You see, you un understand the strategy. What is the, the value at zero? You see, I need, so I need this coefficient, right? How do I get it? Very simply, yes, thank you. It's one, set x equal to zero. Extremely simple, do you agree guys? Extremely simple, plug in zero everything where you see an X is annihilated and I know that the function at zero equals to one. You with me guys, right? So this is extremely important idea. So whatever we cover, this is kind of like a milestone in mathematics. Plug in zero, I get a zero. Next, uh, if you, you see, you, you realize what you can do. Why do you take derivative? Because you can maneuver a one to be in the, in the first position. If I take the derivative of this function, on one hand, I get the same function. Do you see it? Same function, because that's hypothesis. We're, we're searching for a function that is impervious to derivatives. But if it's an infinite polynomial, and I imagine that I can still take derivatives, uh, you know, um, monomial at a time or one term at a time, uh, that means that um, A1 now jumps into the position of A0. Do you see that? Now, if I plug zero, I, uh, I now realize one is equal to F zero, which is equal to F prime of zero, which is A one, right? So A one is also equal to one. Next, I want to know what's the, uh, what's the coefficient uh, A sub two. I take one more derivative and again, it doesn't change the function, yes? Because it's just a, you know, one derivative, you do it consecutively. You take one derivative, it's F, take another derivative, it's F. And this time what I get is one equal to F zero, which is equal to twice A uh, sub two. 
And that means a sub two equals to one half. Are you clear? Now well, tell me please what a sub three equal to. What's the next coefficient equal to? Thank you guys. One over six. Don't let it not be known guys. I will never be angry at you for not understanding something, but I, I can tell me, I can tell you exactly what is my trigger. If you're indifferent, if I see indifference in your eyes, uh, that, that, that bothers the hell out of me. I cannot, you cannot even imagine, right? I can get red and explode, right? Indifference is just the most annoying, the most disgusting thing that, I, that you see in the universe. And that is uh, one over three factorial. You see, what, why is the three, three factorial is three times two times one. Why is this pattern appearing? It's because of the power rule, right? You can even imagine focusing on only uh, the x cubed. x cubed, derivative is three x squared. Derivative again, three times two, x to the one. And then derivative again to kill out the x, it's three times two times one. You have this power rule, which you should prove. You know how to prove it when, it, when it's an integer for sure, yes? Make sense? We, we develop this shortcut, we now understand how it works. And in general, you see, it's, it, how do I find the nth coefficient? The nth coefficient is just, I, I can solve uh, for each coefficient simultaneously. That's the idea. You understand guys what the n means here? It's like, uh, if n is two, I know what the coefficient is. If n is three, I know the coefficient. It's like I solve simultaneously infinitely many problems because they're similar and I see the pattern, right? So the nth coefficient will be a n x to the power of n. So I know I take enough derivatives, exactly n derivatives. So you have n dropping and minus one dropping and minus two dropping all the way to, uh, uh, to the last one dropping, right? And then the x disappeared. So it will be n factorial times a sub n. And the function wasn't changed. And this coefficient is now first. I plug in zero, everything else is annihilated and I get one. Right? So n factorial times a n is one, which means a sub n is one over n factorial. You see how simple it is? Once you understand uh, how to think generally, uh, you can just right away solve the problem for all of them. And uh, this means that my infinite polynomial, also known as Taylor series, but that's a bad name in my opinion because it confuses people. What is a Taylor series, right? Um, and then what is this? This just means summation, right? This means the same thing as I wrote in this line. It means uh, just uh, set n equal to zero, plug it in here. Zero factorial is defined to be one, by the way, All right? And then uh, set n equal, then plus n equal to one, then plus n equal to two, and this is what you get, All right? I wrote a two here, but it's two factorial, it's just the same thing, yes? Two factorial is two times one. So you have this summation. And uh, uh, this, we believe, will solve the equation, the derivative of the function equals to the function, and plug in zero, it gives you one. Right? Plugging zero gives you one pretty, pretty clear. You see the one here in front. Plug zero, all the x's disappear. You're just getting the one. So the second part is satisfied. What about taking derivative of this function? Okay, uh, take the derivative of this function. Look at it, look what happens. Uh, here, this is constant, it's zero. Derivative of x is one. Derivative of one half x squared is two uh, over two x. Derivative of one over three factorial x cubed is three over three factorial x squared, etc. And now I look at it, when I simplify it, it's one plus x plus one half x squared plus one uh, over three factorial x squared and onwards. Do you see that? Uh, in other words, I get the function uh, back. The derivative of this function is the function itself. So this thing solves my equation. And now it gives us a very nice way to calculate this number e. Okay, what is e to the x? It's one plus x plus one half x squared plus one over three factorial x cubed and onwards. And if I plug in e to the one, one here, I get, uh, I get my estimate of e. e I'm claiming is one plus one plus one half plus one over three factorial and onwards. Do you see what I have here? Uh, if I believe in the existence of e to the x, I can in fact figure out uh, a formula for E, I can find that E between, uh, between two and three that I claimed that would exist, okay? So uh, I can, instead of summing it forever, I can truncate, so I can give an approximation as you often do, okay? So if I uh, approximate it up to uh, the 
five number after after that means by a polynomial of degree five I approximate uh, then e will be roughly 2.71 you see this just the sum you can use a calculator if you prefer it's two one plus one is two two plus one half plus one six plus one over 24 plus one over 120 is approximately 2.71 and if you try this in your calculator, try to see if, if uh, 2 to the uh, 0.71 to the power of x, if its derivative is um, at 0, is going to be 1. You put, uh, again, the 1 over 1,000 in your calculator, and you get 0 0.997, somewhat close to 1. Now, if you just add one more term, just add it up to the, up to the 6 power, 6 factorial here, right? And then you get an approximation like 2.718. And if you plug this in your calculator, you get 1.00396. Do you see that? You see the improvement, right? Uh, of course, I mean, I'm using a calculator in a way that's cheating, but I'm just showing you how this idea is truly uh, working. Isn't it amazing, right? Uh, just because you believed in this uh, object, it starts uh, suddenly gaining material. It suddenly becomes live of sort in a sort of sense right it, it, it's 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 materializing that's what i want to say okay and uh, this is the remark about this technique this is called um, uh, taylor expansion for uh, for a function if i know uh, the value of the function at zero and all the derivatives at zero i can hope to represent it as an infinite polynomial Okay, and of course, uh, because uh, this we assume an infinite polynomial is infinitely differentiable, uh, we would have to have this original function infinitely differentiable. If at some point derivatives are no longer possible, it's not going to work. Okay, so I, uh, here is the optional section. I will not uh, truly go over it uh, because um, you don't know the binomial theorem, I believe, right? Just with slight amount of effort, you will understand it. Here is what we actually proved, guys. What we actually proved is, uh, you see, I, I right away connected it to e to the x, but maybe, um, well, what reason did I have to say e to the x to begin with, right? Uh, first of all, it seems that we can use this uh, infinite polynomial. We don't have to add to infinity, we just approximate. We eventually think we added enough terms and it's a good enough representation of the quantity, okay? So this function can be calculated uh, at any number, at root of two, if you can approximate root of two, uh, or at anything, right? So any value I plug it in, I'm multiplying and adding this value. So uh, the procedure is clear enough. You understand what I mean, guys? So uh, for instance, for instance, you, 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 you see, you need to see, of course, when you plug in uh, root of two. When you plug in root of two, so for example, what, what would be the meaning of e uh, to the power of root two? that would be the same as one plus root of two plus uh, one half root of two squared plus one over six root of two cubed and onwards, right? And of course, uh, you don't add that for, forever. You just decide, well, I, I add it up to some number of terms and then I hope that this is good enough approximation. You can then uh, even speak about approximations, how good they are, you, you know, but, but uh, that's another story. That's uh, numerical analysis. Provided you can approximate root of two, you can carry out this calculation, right? Before e to the power of uh, root two me, me means nothing to you. I mean, what does it mean to, uh, to multiply e by itself root two number of times? But uh, this second line makes perfect sense to us. You agree? Guys, uh, may, let me be sure that uh, you understand. So please uh, write in the comments if you understood uh, this point and what we have covered so far. So uh, root of two in the calculator, you understand. Uh, how do we approximate root of two? That's yet another problem, right? The root of two is, let's say, roughly 1.414. I can actually teach you how to approximate root of two or, or those things if you are interested, right? Uh, many ways, right? If you are clever, you can come up with uh, ways on the spot. And uh, if you stay with me and you're curious, I can show you that as well. So roughly root of two, let's say 1.414. So I can uh, take one plus 1.14, I can square 1.14, I can uh, approximate this quantity, okay? 
I hope you understand what I'm talking about, guys. Right? It's not for nothing. This uh, effort spent. Yeah, of course, Joshua. Right. So uh, I asked. I asked this. I asked this. What is e to the power of root of two? That made very little sense to us, but now I can interpret it as this uh, polynomial, which is one plus root two plus one half root two squared and onwards, uh, where I truncate the summation. Let's say maybe I only want to add it up to power five. And then of course I don't get the exact value, but I'm getting an approximation, which is pretty much what you have in your calculators, right? This thing you can actually now use to calculate. So how many people got it? Let's see. So we have not enough. I mean, I have how many people uh, understood? Yes, yes. What about the rest of you, right? So, uh, we just, just what, four people understood it? One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, eight. We have uh, here in, in class today, 30 people. But about two thirds of the class, have you understood it? Good. And by understanding means you can use those ideas. That's what I truly want you to, uh, to skill to gain. Okay. Understand it now, guys, because if I see that you do not understand and you get 100 on my exams, right, I will assume you're not getting 100 on my exams, but somebody else is doing it. And then I will have, you, have to ask you questions. I don't want to get to that point. Yes, that's beautiful, Aki. We, are still, we still need to know what's root of two, but we haven't talked about how to calculate root two, right? But even that I can show you many very simple, I can show you a very, very simple way to calculate root of two. Uh, you, you could have come up with this way on your own. You understand what you try to do is figure out how such ideas uh, were, were, were created. How do you approximate? So here is just a, a, a few words about the optional section. I do, when I say optional, I only mean uh, I'm not cov covering it in class. It's not like you should not understand it. It's, 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 a, it's a good student really wants to know as much as possible. I told you that my best calculus uh, student right now is sitting through my probability course. And uh, she does, she's not registered for it. She just sits there and uh, I'm very, very uh, impressed, of course, right? They, because the requirement is Calc 3 and she only took Calc 1 and she's there. And she understood, she, she keeps uh, with the rest of the, of the students. And many ideas you don't really, the initial many ideas you don't, you just need combinatorics. It's just another type of reasoning, different from calculus that you require. It feels like a different type of math. So, uh, so here is one thing that if you noticed, I hope it's not too much of a bewilderment is in fact, when I carried out this calculation, I carried it abstractly for just uh, some function whose derivative equals to itself and its value at zero equals to one, yes? Why would I know it's an exponential function, right? Uh, why, 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 because e to the x is, is just a mythical beast. I don't understand exponential functions if you think about it. When you, when you uh, press exponential functions in your calculator, you know, very likely what is actually being carried out is a calculation using e to the x because that's the first exponential function that is truly, that it's all its properties can now truly be understood that it has those properties, okay? So uh, what, what you actually do, what you end up doing is this. I show you that if you multiply e to the power of x times e to the power of y for any x and y ends up being equal to e to the power of um, x plus y. And by e, I just mean this, the function f of x times f of y satisfies this property. It's equal to f of x plus y, which is an exponential property. And from this property, I can then uh, see that for any integer value, uh, f of p is equal to f of one to the power of p. Okay, so that's what I carry out here. So I'm showing you that for integer values, it behaves like we expect from an exponential function, but it has the same property uh, for non-integer uh, values, uh, where let's say raising it to the power of root two, I don't even know what it means, you understand? 
So, it, but but it has uh, it has all the properties that you uh, realize exponential functions had. So that's in fact a, a, a way to define what exponential functions even mean, right? Because you understand what I'm saying, guys. Again, uh, you see, look at it. You you can understand what is two to the power of four. That's just bookkeeping. It's two times two times two times two. Yes. But what is uh, two to the power of uh, one half? You see, what is it truly? Well, e to the power of one half is now very easily understood. You see, e to the power of one half is one plus one half plus uh, one half, uh, one half squared plus one over six, one half cubed and onwards. You understand? It's now extremely clear what it is, e to the one half. And why is it equal to the square root of e? This equals to the square root of e because uh, of uh, the multiplicative, pro multiplicative properties that uh, I have that e to the one half, e to the one half, that means I multiply the number by itself, ends up being equal to e to the one half plus one half based on that property, which ends up being e to the power of one, which is e, okay? So uh, uh, using those ideas, I can in fact uh, just begin to understand what exponential functions are even. And every other exponential function can be described in terms of e, but that's later. Okay, so in fact, uh, uh, doing this abstract procedure is truly the first time I understand exponential functions. There are other ways to do that. I mean, it's not a unique way, but that's a pretty simple one. So uh, my rant, guys, how many of you understood my rant so far? this uh, small thing, it's, uh, it's not, um, I hope you understand. So please let me know, just out of curiosity, how many of you understood what I just said? Yeah, so, uh, so, okay. And the rest of you guys, uh, I, I lost you. Yes, Edwin, right? Uh, uh, again, this is just, um, this is the an optional section, right? Okay, so uh, my point is this, right? So I solve this, uh, uh, this uh, equation, derivative of a function equal uh, to the function and uh, the function at zero equals to one. When I solve this equation, I was not, I can solve it without any reference to exponential functions. And I find that uh, the function without any reference to exponential functions, this is equal to one plus X plus one half X squared plus one over six X cubed and on. Yes. And then, uh, uh, then I can show that this function satisfies the properties we will expect to have of an exponent, right? So because what properties do we have of an exponent? We know that for instance, uh, two to the power of uh, three multiplied by two to the power of two equals to two uh, to the power of uh, three plus two. This is obvious because of multiplication and the powers are integers. This just means multiply two by itself three times times two multiplied by itself two times. Altogether, it's two multiplied by itself three plus two times. But uh, if I have, let's say two to the power of, um, well, two to the power of one half multiplied by two to the power of five. In your school, you were taught this is two to the power of one half plus five. But that's no longer as obvious because first of all, I have to understand what's the one half is even doing. What is the one half power, right? And secondly, and secondly, um, how do I verify this is true? It's no longer just uh, bookkeeping. If, if, if I even verify that two to the power of one half should symbolize the root of two, right? Why, why is the root of two uh, times uh, two to the power of three equal to two to the power of one half plus, um, did I say three or did I say here? Five, right? Uh, one half plus five, okay? What does it, so when you start thinking about it, how well do you know the exponent laws? Many of you forgot them entirely. And uh, even if you understood it with integers, 
how do you carry out those operations when it's not an integer, okay? You understand what I'm saying, guys? But uh, with uh, this function, if you understand the binomial theorem, uh, you uh, very, very quickly understand what it means to multiply to multiply e to the power of any number, any real number times e to the power of any other number, right? So because you just have this function multi at, at some value multiplied by this function times another value, it's, it's this function, um, you know, uh, evaluated at uh, the sum of those two values. So that means, it, it, again, this is just purely pure notation. That means that if I have e to the power of, let's say, root two times e to the power of, I say to the power, that's just notation, guys. You understand? It is, it's just, it's a fiction here. Uh, the power of uh, root seven e is e to the power of root two plus root seven. I, I know what this means. Because uh, again, there is no power, you understand? There is just this function, it has this uh, additive property, which I noticed in exponentials for only integer values. Are you with me guys? Do you understand? You might say, oh, but, but isn't it doing the same thing? We have, we have the power on the top. That's just me writing. I, what does it even mean, you understand? What does it mean to take a number to the power of root of two? What am I trying to say exactly, right? It's extremely clear what I'm trying to say when I multiply two polynomials. Okay, guys, so I'll move on. Uh, I hope uh, it's not confusing, uh, uh, confusing you. That's why it was an optional section and uh, not really why. why. The why is because although I was told you, you are supposed to know binomial theorem from pre-calculus, I bet you don't. So this is something that uh, I teach in combinatorial analysis. It's not uh, very long and it's very easy to learn it if you, of course, you're willing and you will be smarter for it but uh, I don't have time to teach it in this class, okay? So here I show that it behaves like, uh, like an exponential function. All right, so let's go to the next thing here. Take a, sh take a breath, guys. I'm trying to show you something now very interesting. And whenever it's slightly more interesting, it's, it's exponentially more complicated. So, yes, you know, after this class, I will probably have to take a drink. And, uh, you know, when, you, when it's a, a cold day, no Russian will go without tea and no Russian goes without alcohol. So here is uh, how I will have my drink once I'm done with this class. I will have uh, one glass of tea and uh, a glass of the same shape and size containing rum, right? So, you know, you drink tea with rum. So I take a sip of my tea and then I, I pour the rum until the glass is full again. I mix it thoroughly and I drink. And uh, uh, after I took another sip, I pour a little bit more rum, I mix it and I take a drink. And I continue doing that until until both glasses are empty. Clear so far? Now my question is, it's a weird question. What is going to be the probability that the last uh, sip that I drink contains only tea? So the very last glass, only tea, no alcohol. What's the probability of that? And um, how do we make the problem more precise? Are you with me guys? Well, yes, the drug one, of course, depends on how we formulate uh, this uh, question. Okay, so let's try to imagine that, uh, that um, we only have in the glass only three molecules of tea and three molecules of alcohol in the other glass to just try to understand sampling simply, okay? And imagine that I will drink one molecule at a time. So every time I take a sip, I remove exactly one molecule. Okay, that's what, what my sip is going to be like. So here is my glass of tea. It contains uh, molecule one, molecule two, molecule three of tea. And the other glass is a glass of rum containing three 
molecules, okay? So then I observe the following, right? So the probability that, uh, that the, last, the last sip I take is that of T is that the last molecule I sample is either molecule one or molecule two or molecule three. Are you with me? One of those. So uh, clearly it's going to be, the probability is going to be three. There is no preference between those molecules. So it's going, the probability is going to be three times the probability I sample molecule one as my last molecule. You understand? It has to survive uh, all the sampling until the very end. Are you with me? I cannot see your faces. So what do I know? I only see one person. And, and here, presence in spirit, you understand what I'm saying, guys? Yes, yes. Uh, you see, I, I cannot sample one molecule here. Uh, so this is, of course, um, a fictional thing here. Right? You might be right. Maybe the molecules bind. Maybe I, well, there's so many problems here. That's not important, right? It's, if it feels artificial to you, what it models is not artificial. You understand? My point is to show you something pretty interesting, right? Hopefully, you will, you will realize it. So what I'm saying is that uh, the probability last molecule sampled is uh, that of T is either one or two or three, which is three times the probability I sample molecule one. So let's begin the experiment, okay? I sample some molecule. So let, what's the probability one survives to the very end? That means after the first uh, drink, it survived and then it, there was a replacement. Uh, the molecule that was removed was replaced from the other beaker. You see, that's why there are two here. What's the probability of surviving first round? Surviving. I'm, I'm, I'm of course assuming you know something about probability, but that's a basic uh, probability. What's the probability of surviving first, uh, first round? Uh, Alexa, uh, it's actually good, but, uh, but one third means that you actually selected it. One out of three, you selected this one out of three, but what's the probability of surviving? Surviving first round any one of three molecules can be sampled. To survive, it must not be picked. So either two or three was picked. Two thirds, beautiful. Survival is two thirds. You understand guys, Alexa, you said uh, uh, one third, that's the probability of being selected, but you want not to be selected. To survive uh, to the very last end, I'm just focused on molecule one. I want to know what's the probability this one molecule survives uh, to the last. Two thirds, yes? So survival here is two thirds. Good. Now there was a replacement. That's why I called them green. I don't really have uh, to focus which is red, which is not. I only focused which is molecule one and which is not molecule one. Yes. What's the probability of surviving two rounds? Survive first round and survive the next round. What's the probability there? Let's uh, record it so that uh, you're not lost here, guys. So the probability of survival is two thirds. What's the next probability of survival again? Two thirds again, and, uh, and all together, two thirds squared altogether. Not plus, times. Times, not uh, because look at two thirds plus two thirds, it's already more than one. Cannot possibly be, it's times. Yes, guys? What's the probability of surviving again? Yes, cubed. That means surviving three rounds. Probability of surviving three rounds is two thirds cubed. Now, what's the probability of surviving another round from here to here? No, because we now no longer have replacement. Look at it. After this one, there is no replacement. Exactly. So it is, um, 
So it's uh, two thirds for first uh, cubed. Uh, then uh, we have uh, uh, we have uh, it's going to be. How should I say that? First sampling two thirds. Next sampling uh, uh, two thirds squared. Next sampling is it's not here. It should uh, I should write it here to this line here. Right? So here it is two thirds cubed and you're right, right? Two thirds to the power of three. I will write it times two thirds. I will isolate it this time. And then uh, this would be times one half. So it would be two thirds cubed times two thirds times one half. Okay, I'll write it like this. Are you with me guys? E, good. Good. You understood what that, what happened here, right? So the pattern, you see that, right? And that was uh, three molecules and three molecules. Okay. So the probability that uh, that molecule one survives is two thirds cubed times one third, because here you see two thirds times two thirds times two thirds times two thirds times one half. So it's uh, two thirds times one third. And, uh, and then the probability that it's one of molecules uh, one, two or three, it's the same probability multiplied by three, right? Because uh, it's either molecule one or two or three. So multiply that by three and you get uh, simply two thirds to the power of three, which can also be written as one minus one third to the power of three. Can you come up with uh, a formula quickly uh, if I have four molecules and four molecules? You, you hear me guys? So try to tell me what happens. You can draw a picture or we can try to do it together. Let's see, so uh, new share. What we want to do is uh, a formula where you have uh, one beaker containing molecule one, two, three, four, and another beaker containing, um, containing alcohol molecules, four of them. What's the probability that molecule one, this molecule survives, survives uh, to the very last? So let's see, let's do it together guys. Uh, this time is uh, three quarters, right? It, 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 it should not be picked on round number one. So what we have is first time it's three quarters times. So now uh, one molecule was uh, replaced from here. So I erase one particle, yes? Now, what is it now? It is three over four. Now as soon as, as, soon as that is done, another molecule uh, replaces the one that was removed. Now survival again is three quarters. Yes. Now, again, three quarters. Now, uh, last replacement. Again, three quarters. Now, there is nothing to replace the molecule that was deleted. So now uh, the next round is uh, two thirds. Yes? Nothing to replace uh, this molecule. What, what is it now? Write in the comments. One half, brilliant. One half. Do you see that, guys? You see the pattern? Very simple, yes? Um, I'm assuming you know that much, right? So that times one half. 
Now look uh, what can what I can do here. Now I can I can uh, I, I see this three and this three is canceled. Uh, this two and this two is canceled. Yes. So what I end up having is three quarters to the power of four times one quarter. And that's the probability that molecule one survived. But I want a probability that T survived. So it's one of four molecules, right? So probability that last molecule was T is, is the probability the last molecule was one plus the probability the last molecule was two plus the probability the last molecule was three plus the probability the last molecule was four, which is simply four for each of them, if I just make a molecule to the focus, it will be the same probability. So it's four times three quarters to the power of four times one quarter. So that equals to simply three quarters to the power of four, which I can also write as one minus one quarter to the power of four. Are you with me? You understood guys? Uh, that's with four molecules. Now, usually, can you, can you guess uh, what it will be if I have a million molecules? Usually you have many, many molecules, right? So what's the, what, is if I ha what happens if I have uh, one million molecules? So it's one, 10 to the power of six. And this is all the way to 10 to the power of six. What would happen if I have a million molecules? What would be uh, my probability? Can you guess? Or maybe I'm jumping to uh, to high up. Right? Let's let's do it with. Uh, so uh, let's see, let's see let's see what pattern we have here. Let me uh, do it more carefully. So if I had four molecules, uh, the number we obtain is one minus one quarter to the power of four. With three molecules. It's uh, one minus uh, one third to the power of three, that it's one of the water molecules, right? Yes. Yes, so with a million molecules, so, so with, with, let's say with, with five molecules, we expect the number to be one minus one over five to the power of five. So therefore with uh, 10 to the power of six molecules, it is one minus Minus what? Joshua, great. What about the rest of you? Exactly, Stephen. So it's one minus one over 10 to the power of six, to the power of 10 to the six. And uh, of course, you know, million molecules is not a lot. How much do you have in a full glass of tea? Billions of them, yes? You have billions of molecules. So you have billions of molecules and, um, and this is uh, what we end up having. In, in general, the number of molecules is huge. So we say it's striving to infinity. So we have, one minus one over n to the power of n as n goes to infinity is an extremely good approximation. Are you with me guys? What is the value of this limit? Uh, I wonder what you would say. You understood how I get this limit, right? So five molecules is just approximation, but now the beaker has billions upon billions of molecules. So in essence, uh, it's, it's like limit as n goes to infinity of one minus one over n to the power of n. That would be approximating the probability. What is that limit?
That's fine, guys. You don't have to be sure of anything, right? Uh, and don't let me ever bother you. You see, I am not. It's a computer. You don't have to throw anything at me. I just want to see what you would uh, what you would say. So suppose that here you really want to know what that probability is, and you calculate it. What will you get? How would you do that? What would you think? Well, let me help you since you're so quiet. Well, what we have is, um, let's actually go to the whiteboard. So we are interested in limit as n goes to infinity, one plus one over n to the power of n. Oh, well, that's very simple. This is, um, well, I can put the limit in, so limit as n goes to infinity, it's one plus one over n, or maybe let's even do it uh, like this, right? So for this guy, this guy as n goes to infinity goes to what value? This guy goes to what value as n goes to infinity? That's good guys, uh, it's, it's, it's fine. So uh, what about um, one over n? Where does it go? close to zero, right? So this guy goes to zero. So of course this limit is equal to one. How many of you understood it? Oh yeah, great. Yeah. Did you lose consciousness the rest of you? Are you on Mount Everest where there is no oxygen? Yes, that's good. You know, your blog that I imagine, uh, I'm, I'm just lecturing you and I imagine you're, you're already eating your friend. It's just uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the only one, I don't know. My jokes do not land like your airplane in which you were sitting, I suppose. Uh. <laughs> so, so. What's what's going on, guys? Right? Uh, you're not show me your faces or just interact with me. Do I mean it's useless to ask? I don't know. Come on, what's going on with you? Right? Are you that you're tired? You're exhausted? You have no idea? You lost the will to live? What's what's going on? So, my my limit as I as I wrote is it is it one? Let me just ask this question here. Is limit one? So because one over n it goes to zero, so it's one plus zero, it's one, right? Is the limit one?
Okay, one to infinity is one. Maybe good way to reason about it, right? Uh, one to infinity is one. It's because it's, it's, it's one to a number that grows. So that's one, yeah? Okay, sure, uh, Ibad. Don't let me badger you into anything, right? Uh, um, I just want to know what you're thinking, right? But my calculation, correct or not? Christian is the only person I see. <laughs> what about uh, the rest of you? Rania, what is that? What, what is it, Irvin? My little black squares. All right, I think you, you are very tired. We need to uh, have a musical pause. Yes, I would have preferred it not to be in English, but uh, I don't know what, what can I do with you. All right, I'll, I will pause this video and I will play uh, something for you because that's how I, I'm feeling truly. Are you here guys? Yes, the reason I remember that is uh, I think of your end. Yes, indeed. It is the dreams in which I'm dying, the best that I ever had, truly, right? <laughs> yes, uh, Alexa, what, uh, what song request would you have uh, uh, liked? Sure, you want it right now, uh, Alexa? You see, I'll, I'll be, I guess, a, ra a radio here since... Uh, <laughs> teacher, tell me what's my lesson. Yes, uh, I don't know, guys. Do you, so, uh, let's see. Do, do you want to hear Celine Dion? Uh, what is it? Uh, I'll play it. Right, it's, 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 it might as well be, you know, uh, we might as well. <laughs> you know, uh, I, 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 when, I, when I look at topology, I, I, I'm thinking about uh, what's the proper way to uh, tie the rope. Right. So, uh, okay, it's a, so Celine Dion, I'll play you one song, you rest, and then we get back to uh, to uh, this uh, work, okay? So I'll, I I pause this lecture again, uh, let's listen to Celine Dion or whatnot. Uh, mind, mind, Liba God. <laughs> All right. And the flute tradition, I'll try, Alex. I don't know right, how easy it is to find it. Okay, guys. <sighs> All right, so uh, uh, what is this limit, guys? What is this limit? That, uh, uh, that we woke up now what is limit as n goes to infinity, one minus one over n to the power of n, what is that? I mean, just proof of life, right? I, 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 I just wonder, you can just try it. Oh, I do not know, or, or this limit seems difficult, or I think it's equal to one or something that I, I know you are still there. Steven says one, uh, Lakey says one, Zainab says one, whoa, okay, wonderful. You're beginning to wake up. Yes, limit is one. Yes, kind of difficult. Great, I think it's one, but it's not. Uh, but not that uh, you can explain why. And he is going to say, "Oh, we are wrong." We see, Irvin, you are already a psychologist, right? 
sometimes I say you're all wrong and if you, even if you're right, because I, I don't expect you to be right anymore, right? <laughs> it's okay, guys. What, you're, you're, are, are you worried that it's like a rat, rat experiment? You're worried that the electricity will shock you or something? Okay, I cannot get to you, you see? Mm, come on, guys. Uh, what is what? What is this limit? Is it one? Let's let's ask it this way. Is the limit one? Is the limit one? Right. That's the question I'm asking. Okay, bud. Thank you. What about the rest of you? It might be zero. Okay, interesting. Very close to one. Okay. All right, so let me, I guess, tell you guys. You know what song, I, uh, since I'm going to tell you, uh, that here's another song I thought, don't tell me because it hurts. That's when I look at your face. Oh, I don't look at your face. It's don't tell me because it hurts. That's the song I should have played you. Is this one to infinity, which is one? And Irvin, yes, uh, you are absolutely wrong in, in saying, that, well, sorry, you are absolutely right in saying that uh, those that said it's one, I'm going to say it's wrong. It's definitely not equal to one. Why is it not equal to one? Well, let's see. Of course not, right? Uh, I mean, I'm hoping that you hesitated because uh, you understood it's not a simple limit. And E equal to one means what? With certainty, you are going to drink uh, a molecule of water last? That doesn't seem correct. So uh, what is this limit, guys? The answer is E to the minus one. E to the minus one is the actual answer. Okay, we're going to try to understand why. So we need to play with our derivatives. So first of all, uh, e to the x satisfies this formula. The derivative of uh, e to the x is e to the x. And if I go back to the definition, look at this, guys. If I go back to this definition, that means that limit as h goes to zero, f of x plus h minus f of x over h equals to f of x. Take a very deep breath, guys. Uh, you need a lot of oxygen and a lot of thinking because what I'm going to say is going to not be understood by many of you, unfortunately, right? Definitely not in first trial. Are you ready? Do you understand this line? Yes? Come on, guys, right? Uh, show me your faces. I need to see your reactions, right? Open your cameras. I want to see young, beautiful faces. I am so alone. Or have you become hideous uh, uh, through this pandemic? Yes. So that means what? You should know you're hideous uh, only in the soul, right? If you're a Dorian Gray, you understand that, right? It's, it's you, you rot from the inside. So uh, here is what it means. If H goes to zero, uh, that's the same uh, rough thing. You see, I, limit is just a fancy expression where H is small. So if H is small, I can, I can say approximately, uh, this quotient is approximately F of X, yes? And then if I rework it, it means that f of x plus h minus f of x, I multiply by h, is approximately h times f of x, which means that f of x plus h is approximately f of x plus h f of x, which when I factor f of x out, it's 1 plus h times f of x. You see that? And this gives me a very nice idea. It, it gives me an idea about recursion. 
don't look at the, at the symbols. This means that uh, a function evaluated at some number equals to a number prior multiplied by one plus the step backwards that you took. Here is uh, what I'm saying. F of a number, that's how I read it. The function evaluated at a number is one plus small step, the number uh, minus the small step plugged into F. <coughs> so in symbols, I can write it this way. I can say that uh, I just uh, now, now ch change the symbol X. This just means a number, you understand? This is a number, this is a number. I just, I'm talking about something. So the function at a number is one plus a small step times the function, the, take the step back from that number. Are you, uh, you, do you understand what I mean uh, from this line to that line, guys? That's just, um, that's just literacy. In other words, I did not look at the symbols, I interpreted the meaning. And that's what I hope you are doing. Do you understand? Please let me know if you do. Or do I have to re-explain it? You, you understood what I did here. I'm trying to understand something more about this function. So I begin with the definition of the derivative and uh, because the function has, uh, you know, it's equal to itself under differentiation, this limit equals to f of x. Now I, I cannot say, it, it, I can drop the limit if I make h very small and say it's kind of equal, not quite equal, but close to equal, right? If h is really, really small, it's going to be close to equal. And that allows me to, uh, to come up with an equation. This is the equation I come up with. You see, I just begin solving for f of x plus h in terms of f of x, and I come up with this uh, line. The function at x plus h equals to one plus h times the function at x. And then if I'm clever, I realize uh, what this means. This means the function evaluated at a number, this is just some number, equals to one plus small step back, function evaluated at the number minus the, the small step back which I can write in symbols as f of, an, of x, f of a number x, approximately one plus h, f of x minus h. And now I'm going to walk back to zero because the function at zero is equal to one. That's the, what I know, right? So what I do is I divide uh, the interval from zero to x into million uh, steps. So x over n is supposed to be a tiny step. The bigger the n, the smaller is the step, yes? And I'm going to walk backwards to zero. And that's how I'm going to figure out uh, this limit. Are you up with me? In a, that's called recursion. You understand what's recursion is that uh, to evaluate uh, this uh, the function at this number, I need to evaluate it at a prior number. To evaluate at a prior number, I need to do it before that. So I go step all the way back at zero and then I have my evaluation. And here is how that's supposed to go. Look at it. The function starting at X is one plus X over N that's taking one step back times the function at X minus X over N. You see, so that's one step back. Now you see I underlined it in red. So from here, I will take another step back. So that will drop in front one plus X over N. And now the function is evaluated that's two steps back. And continuing in this fashion, uh, you see, look at it, it's this one plus X over N times one plus X over N. It will be one plus X over N squared. So continuing in this fashion, look at it, what happens? I take N steps back, it's one plus X over N to the power of N the function at x minus n x over n, which is the function at zero. Before I continue, are you with me guys? Do you understand how I get this formula? When you go home, you don't close the book. You actually try to do it on your own. Do you understand? You don't look at anything, try to derive this idea on your own. That's how you know you got it. Do you, this is what I'm trying, why I try to teach you the derivative so much, right? Is that you are, um, if you understand this well, you can play with this quantity. You can realize what you can do with it. So here I am moving back until I get this formula that f of x is approximately equal to one plus x over n to the power of n. I get this uh, equation, which is similar to what we had uh, with, the, uh, with the molecules in my beakers. Do you see that? Look, 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 guys, how you remember it, you remember the idea is that when you understand derivatives, you can actually be, you become flexible, you can play around with it. You understand limit as h goes to zero, you understand that this limit is just saying h is a perfection of zero. But that means that if h is already very close to zero, this ratio is approximately the function at x, yes? Because that's uh, what, what limits mean. There's nothing so special about the limit. It's just uh, you carry the perfection to infinity. But if you cannot carry to infinity, this is not a true equal sign. It's, it's kind of equal. In other words, if H is really, really small, 
uh, then you will not notice the difference. Okay, so uh, then I, I have a recursive formula. In other words, I see that f of one number is, evaluate, is, is really one plus a step back times uh, f uh, of the number minus the step back. And the step back has to be very small. So then I want to evaluate what is f of x. Uh, and the, the only way I can do that is I have to go all the way back to zero because I know e to the zero is one. That's the only thing I know, yes? So, uh, so then uh, by this recursive step, I go one step back. One plus x over n is, is the size of the step. X over n is the size of the step. That's this formula here, you see? The size, it's one plus the size of the step. In the, x could be a large number, but if n is huge, n has to be huge, and then it will, it, this will be a small step, right? The bigger the x, the, uh, the, the, hue, the bigger the n must be. n must be enormously larger than x, right? Maybe millions of times larger. So this number is almost zero. So the steps that I drew here are very large. They should be microscopic. You probably will not see those steps. They are gonna be like this, you know? But, uh, that, the, but that just means taking many steps. So you take one step, you drop one plus x uh, over, uh, over n. Take another step, you, you have now an extra one plus x over n. And then if you take n steps, it's going to be one plus x over n to the power of n. And now this is zero. X minus n times x over n is x minus x, which is f of zero, which is one. So I have that my function is approximately one plus x over n to the power of n. And it will be exactly that if the steps are smaller and smaller. So I push limit to infinity. Do you see that? This is not a, a completely rigorous proof, but it's very, very illuminating. And here is what we just verified that a limit as n goes to infinity one plus x over n to the power of n is e to the x. You understand? Here guys, uh, uh, here is uh, the quick calculations that I want you to perform. What are those values? A, B, C, and D please. If you understood, what are, what are those limits equal to? You have to understand this guy's very important limit. Okay, A is, okay guys, write A equal B equal, you know, maybe if you could write it uh, simultaneously, let's see if you can do it. A, B, or you can just, just say uh, one number, a space, another number, space, another number, so it's in one message. Think about it. Right, ideally, so I see under the one name, I see all the solutions. That would be very nice of you if, I, if you can do that. If you are lost, guys, let me know. I say I don't see your faces. I do not know uh, if, if the explanation carried through or not. And I, I have a strong feeling you will forget about it as soon as my class is over. And that, that's very, very upsetting. You understand uh, what I would have done is, okay, I closed the books, have I learned it? Okay, here, let me try to derive this formula. Okay, Lakey, where are you lost? Uh, at which point, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's, guys, you see, there is nothing wrong about being lost, just care to not be, that's all I want from you. Did you understand uh, this part? beginning of it you see uh, if you if you what i'm trying to teach you guys is to actually actively think about the uh, about this right so sounds many, many of you what what you think is learning mathematics is you memorize a formula and you solve a bunch of uh, questions where you like a monkey you plug in a number into the formula but you have not understood what the formula works and you are not able to use it in any creative way mathematics is very creative and that makes it of course very hard Okay, so uh, if I understand limits very well, I understand uh, that if I push a limit, let's say as h goes to zero, that's very similar to just plugging in a number very close to zero, good? And since I know that my function, its derivative equals to the function itself, then uh, I, I have this approximation. This is the definition of the derivative without the limit approximately equals to f of x when h is extremely small. Good. So the first part, guys, this part is excellent. That's, that's already half the work. Do you understand uh, this line and you understand how it becomes this line? Yes. And then uh, the next part is very clever. The next part is you solve uh, for what f of x plus h equals to in terms of f of x. And we get this formula. 
So before I continue, after uh, after this up to this line, everybody understands? Please confirm. This line, do you understand it? Everybody, guys, I need to see. Right? I see four people replying. So what happened to the to the rest of the class? I don't want to lose you. I want you to stay with me. Yes? And you would be able to come up with this formula on your own, right? Let's say I ask you on Tuesday and it's the accumulator still contains something, right? I don't forget it, guys, only for one reason. You see, I can forget your names. I, I already don't know most of your names, right? And why? Because your name is not associated with who you are. I don't know it, right? It's not, there's arbitrary association, but this is extremely not arbitrary. It just uh, when you realize what's happening, it's just light. Good. So up to this line, you understand? Now, what is this? Now, now you see, uh, here is the thing. Many of you are seeing X and H and all that stuff, but you should see what it's, what it's really saying. It is saying, this is just a number. Do you agree? X plus H, X, what is X? X is some input. I put a number in, right? I just talk about a general number. I'm not specific. Right, it's, it's like if I were to say um, men uh, usually or men have uh, um, men have deep voices, right? They have deeper voices than women, something like this, right? So I made a very general statement about uh, every single per uh, man. Somehow I speak about all of them at the same time. So this is just a number. This X is just some number. And X plus H is just some number. So what this is saying is, uh, here is how I view it. This is saying that the function evaluated at a number, do you see this? This is just a number, is one plus a small step, h is a small step, it's a small number, right? One plus a small number times f of uh, this number minus that other small number, or minus a step. You see, I think of it as a step. And I can write it using uh, using different letters. You understand? You look at it here is x plus h, and here is x. They are not the same thing here. I'm, I just kind of use uh, use this this idea. I write this thing uh, instead of using hi, what is it hashtag? I use um, I use x. You understand? So this function at some number is one plus a small step back, multiplied by the function of the number minus the small step back. That's what I uh, noticed from this, uh, from this formula. How many of you understand up to this line? Because it, this, is, this line is determining everything. You understand what, what happened guys, right? It, it's just what you have to train to do is, let's say when I say read this word, you're saying we. Uh, or when I, when I uh, ask you to read uh, this word, right? You're not saying K N O W, right? You just uh, you look at it, the meaning comes to your mind, and then you say no. So you're just reading the meaning, not the symbols. So the meaning is the function at a number is one plus a small step. The function at the number minus the small step. Notice I don't mention X. I just place it here, right? It's just uh, it's just a notation to describe it. Nothing more. But the gist is this, is that you take steps. So then I think I need to walk all the way to zero. Why to zero? Because the function at zero is equal to one, I know it, right? So anywhere else, it's kind of difficult to know it. I mean, you can calculate now using this other formula, but you get my point, right? Uh, this, is, this is a different uh, limit, a different thing that we need to know here. So here I begin walking. So I, I make one step back and, and I pay for that step by multiplying by one plus uh, X over N. And then uh, for, for this red part, now I'm at a different number. I make another step back, right? The steps are all of the same size, X over N. I divided the interval into same sized steps. So I take one more step back. Now you see I took two steps back from where I used to be. And I uh, multiplied uh, again by one plus X over N. So that's X, one plus X over N squared. How many steps do I need to get, uh, do I need to take to get to zero? I need to take N steps. So that's what, what I have. You see, I take three steps, four steps, all the way n steps. I have one plus x over n to the power of n, and then I'm at zero. You understand? But at zero, it's one. So my function is approximately equal to one plus x over n to the power of n, but approximately. And my approximation is better and better um, uh, as soon as I make the steps smaller. 
right? So that's why I push limit as n goes to infinity. If I make many steps, if n is uh, close to infinity, x over n is close to zero. So the step is infinitesimally small, right? And then the, this formula is more and more true. And it's true in the limit. So then I get that this limit as n goes to infinity of this quantity is e to the x. Good? You follow guys how I figured it out? You see, so that, that's what you do. You play with them. And if you know how to play, if you stay, for example, in office, I can show you a very simple game that you can play and you can figure out uh, root of two or root of seven or anything like that, right? Something that you could have figured out on your own. That's, I figured it like this, right? I just kind of, uh, you just do something and, it, uh, and uh, the result comes to you. So then if you understood, this is, this is, the, this is the result, okay? So I see that, uh, that limit as n goes to infinity, one plus x over n to the power of n is e to the x. So what is a, what is b, what is c, what is d? If you reply to that, please do it again, guys. I just went over this explanation. I want to see uh, a, b, c, d to see if you are understanding. Thank you, who? Once you come up with such ideas on your own guys, then uh, you might be hooked. It's like, uh, it's like you are hooked on drugs. You don't think you need it, but then it's pretty much, <clears throat> uh, it gets you so, so high, uh, truly, right? Uh, when you solve something that uh, you no know, others cannot figure out, even, right? or even just you're, you, you, you solve something that you couldn't figure out before it gets you high. Beautiful. Okay, some people are, are, are getting it, but let's see that everybody else is. I hope you are getting it, I'm thinking, right? When you go home, guys, right? You, that's how you do, you practice those ideas. You practice if you understand uh, the proof, that means you don't look into the notes, you just uh, derive it on your own. Can you derive it on your own? If yes, you already are improving your level. All right, so here is uh, here are our solutions. Here, x is five, so it's e to the five. Here, x is minus three, so it's e to the minus three. Here, x is minus one, so it's e to the minus one. Here, x is root of two, so it's e to the root two. Remember uh, in the limit that we had uh, with the probability, it was one minus one over n to the power of n. So this formula is extremely important to recognize hugely important and uh, if you are not happy today it has to do with the number e or this you can your unhappiness can be explained today in terms of the number e your birthdays can be explained in terms of the number e okay let's uh let's see about it right so guys what do you think how likely it is to um, uh, to have a few people share a birthday? Let's say here in the class, how many of you share a birthday? In other words, you have the, a birthday on the same day. Do you think uh, somebody or nobody? So Steven says unlikely, nobody, not really nobody, okay. Well, let's see. I'm not sure how many of you came uh, to class. Who was born on October 20th? If you were born uh, on October 20th, uh, uh, tell me, guys, uh, who here is October 20th? Are you here? October 20th, people? No? Uh, who was born here on May 15th?
I think that uh, it's interesting. So people that have a birthday don't like me, I guess. But uh, two people from this class, are you there guys? Two people from this class were born on May 15th and two people in this class were born on October 12th. I knew that um, I knew uh, with this class uh, that um, two people will share their birthday with 88% likelihood. How did I know that? Because of the number E. Here it is. Suppose the question is this, if there are 40 people in the room, what is the probability that at least two of them share a birthday? I will not bother you with uh, the calculation since I don't know how, how much energy do you have, but it ends up being this number guys, right? You see, once you carry out the calculation, it's approximately one minus one over three, six, five to the power of 780. And then uh, are you there guys? Can you, you, you see, you, if you're interested afterwards, you can read about it. It's, it's something that probability people are definitely bothered. So the birthday problem and the uh, sampling of um, molecules from, from the glasses of tea and alcohol and pretty much almost anything else, pretty much everything else I would say that you can think of uh, will in one way or another involve the number E. And there is a reason for that. And the reason for that is the binomial theorem. And if you, you can understand that in the other, there is also the central limit theorem and uh, other interesting things that you can definitely understand even at this stage, but you have to go into the combinatorial analysis. You have to understand certain interesting ideas. Nobody uh, actually bothered solving the problems that I sent. Right? There were, those are problems for my probability class, but I figured uh, you should also be able to solve those problems. Remember about Dolores that I asked about, uh, about this guy, his name being Humberto Bert, about the dogs? Yes? Think about it. It, it, when you, it, it will change your, your thinking truly, right? When you, when you deal with probability. So one minus one over 365 to the power of 780, what number would you have preferred to see here? The number you would have preferred to see here is uh, 365. Do you know why? Because one minus one over 365 to the power of 365 looks like e to the minus one, because this looks like a large n to the large n. So I introduce the 365 and I divide it over here. And what I get is approximately e to the minus one in here. And uh, this is uh, to the power of 2.137, yes? And, and this is 0 0.118. And that's the probability approximately that uh, nobody shares a birthday. So one minus it will be the probability that at least uh, two people share their birthday. And that is uh, 0.88. So I knew with 88% certainty that if enough of you uh, replied, I will find people that have the same birthday. But again, uh, right, so the people that do have that birthday, I guess, decided not to show up. Not many people like me, I suppose. Here, there's, there are some other very cool uh, features here. For example, uh, you know how you can estimate the number E? Here is a very mischievous way to figure out what E is. Go uh, to maybe an Orthodox Jewish uh, dressing room and then uh, swap their hats and watch uh, which hats they pick up, okay? If you do that, uh, you will figure out uh, the number E. Uh, I'll show you maybe uh, in, the, in the comments, right? Yes, exactly, right? So, and exactly what? If you don't get arrested or anything like that, right? Or, and it's not gonna be considered a hate crime, uh, you can then explain it's for scientific purposes. It's to estimate this beautiful number E. Although you don't need to do it because uh, we have a formula. We have this infinite polynomial, so you can do it without uh, probabilistic methods. So here is, let me show you uh, just that lecture. Yeah, I'm showing it because, you know, you, I look at it, I don't know what, what happens to you. I look at it and, and you know, when I see uh, mathematics that I don't understand, it's like you drew, it's like food that you haven't tried. You should get the same feeling.
I'm not, you see, I, I would have described it to you, but it's just uh, too difficult uh, to do it, right? It's the matching problem, right? So uh, Im here, is, here is what it looks like. Imagine that you go to a dressing room, you need to, uh, to have many people and they should have uh, different hats, right? So imagine this is a dressing room and he, those are their hats and you have many of them, really many of them. So what you do is you shuffle those hats and then see which hat uh, is going to be worn by whom. So here I indicated this is a hat that belonged to person three should have been here. You see, they were shuffled. And then uh, if you play this experiment number of times, the number of total pranks where you go to one synagogue, you do it in their dressing room, you go to another, you do it uh, in the dressing room, total number of pranks divided by uh, total number of times where nobody picks his own hat will be the number E. It will equal to E. And the reason for it is uh, uh, explained here. Look at it, look how beautiful. Blah, 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 blah. Right? And you have this uh, series. You can understand that, but I, I, for that you need to go through probability. Okay? That's uh, what is E? E is involved in exponential growth. So let's say the reason we are here uh, you know, in whatever, you know, that's what the, the official justification is that uh, the coronavirus is spread exponentially, right? And uh, the idea is, I'm going to send you later a video about exponential growth. Many people do not understand anything about it. It's a very, very uh, strange thing, the exponential growth. You see, it's very sudden. So you might have something very little and then it's very suddenly it's an explosion. Yeah, now, there, there was a video um, that, uh, it's actually an old video, but uh, I'll, I'll check it first. And then if I think it's good enough, I'll uh, send uh, you this video to watch about it. But uh, you see, the reason the world uh, appears not chaotic, the reason the world appears not chaotic uh, is um, in some sense, because it's extremely chaotic um, on, a, on a micro scale, but as you zoom out, uh, you have um, some regularities happening, some regularities that have to do in some sense with the number E because they have to do with binomial theorem. So for example, imagine that uh, an atom, either it decays or it doesn't decay, breaks apart or doesn't break up. And each of them behaves chaotically, but as a, as a huge population of atoms, uh, the number of them that will decay is very well uh, approximated by e to some power. Okay, and, that, and, and that's gonna create regularity. So that's how you can judge uh, the age of the universe. That's the idea that you used it. Uh, used to judge. That's how you build atomic clocks. You see, it's it's accuracy on a macro scale. Uh, also, if you understand uh, probability, you will start getting a very strange feeling that I always had um, uh, when I when I lived in Jerusalem. Is that uh, it's it's it, as I mentioned, it's it's like it's like everything is painted on a thin canvas, and when you and you, you look, there are some some crevices that it's pitch black. It's like you are looking into nothing. And uh, you have quantum physicists that right, are high on, uh, on um, probability, I suppose, right? Uh, they, they, one of them postulates a theory that, that matter does not exist in the sense that um, it actually, if, if, you, if you solve, that's the thing, I will not bother you. If you solve the problems or if you're curious uh, um, to solve those problems, I can explain to you. Right, you, you, you remember I asked you, uh, does it matter that, uh, uh, that the girl is wearing her favorite pair of glasses? Does it affect the probability uh, that uh, the person's name is Humbert Humbert? Does it uh, matter that the, that the dog is eating its favorite food? Does it mean the, his, it, does it have an effect on his fur being brown? Okay. And uh, many of you, 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 you see things that are not uh, cause and effect relationship and you think the answer is no. And, there, and, and you are making a big, big mistake because your thinking is uh, not probabilistic. You see? So uh, that happens also in this class. Some of you think, what do I care about this material? It's not gonna be part of my work. The reason you say it this way is because your reason is not probabilistic. You know, you are thinking like this. if you understand what I mean, right? That was uh, also a sort of, uh, you understand, that's what you're thinking, right? It's just, it's very, uh, it, it, you see, but, but you do not exist. That's the thing. Ah. You see, it, it, it's, it's, it's a certain, 
Well, anyhow, I, I won't uh, bother you with it since um, it, it's not, it's not, we're not in probability. If you're interested, uh, we will talk about it, right? If not, um, it's up to you. But uh, there is a, an entirely different um, thing that you observe if you begin understanding probability. And, and a very, very insane thing that you observe. Well, uh, thank you for, uh, for bearing with me in the morning. Uh, do stay if you have questions. We, you should have questions. You should have started practicing the assignments, the exams. You should not be idle outside of this class. Uh, I spent four hours a day when I was learning calculus. You understand that I spent every day four hours studying calculus. You can skip my classes, but only on the condition that you understand the material. So if I, with people that skip my classes, I will test them orally, right? Uh, so you cannot have both, right? I, either you, you don't come to class, but understand perfectly, then that's fine. Or you, you definitely have to show me uh, your effort. It's kind of meaningless to say it here, uh, you came to class, but uh, I see a drop. It should be 35 to 40 people. Take care guys, have a good uh, day. Stay with me if you would like to talk about something. Okay. And if not, then have a good day. You can also come to the other class, agreed? Other class or office hours in the other class, don't delay uh, if you have questions.